Hi there, Frank Shia again. Welcome to our eighth and final class of our eight class series on my world of Oriental rugs. Again, uh, as I have said in the beginning, um, I call it my world of Oriental rugs because I know that I only have limited knowledge, and so it's it would be sort of um, not right to say it's the world of Oriental rugs because the world of Oriental rugs is much bigger than my world of Oriental rugs, but I'm giving you as much knowledge as I have on the subject. Tonight, uh, we're gonna talk about what I feel is uh, kind of interesting, two things actually. We're going to talk about uh, uh, commercial versus collectible and tribal. And also then at the end, we're gonna talk about rugs from around the world, rugs that uh, are produced in other places um, other than Persia, because as you know, in this class, we've sort of uh, directed most of our attention to Persian rugs. But first, let's talk about, uh, you know, uh, what we call collectible or tribal things versus commercial rugs. So when we refer to commercial rugs, I, I know there's probably a better word than commercial, but we're referring to rugs that were woven for the European or American market to put on their floor. Okay, that's essentially it. Collectible or tribal rugs, actually they became collectible. Initially they were just tribal rugs, are actually things that were woven for tribes, uh, for the Bedouin tribes or the different, you know, Turkmen tribes and um, just things they needed to use in their everyday life. Uh, now these things have become collectible and a lot of collectors just buy uh, tribal pieces. But, you know, typical caravan, you'd see, you know, uh, saddle bags and tent bags and blanket bags and grain bags and salt bags. And it's just typical of what you'd see. And all of those were hand woven as well, just the same way that we, that they wove Oriental rugs. They wove all of these other things. So a typical tent, you know, you'd have a uh, maybe a rug on the floor and some kind of covering over things up on top of that there's another bl uh, blanket tent blanket and here's a tent blanket and a bag and just different things that you would see a lot of times they decorated their tent so here you, you see uh you know a tent decorated you've got the bags and you've got the uh tent blankets and just all sorts of different decorations that you would see in a typical these are a little bit more ornate than the typical, but this is the kind of a typical tint that you would see. Uh, this also is very typical of what you'd see in uh, overseas, especially in Afghanistan or Turkmen or Kazakhstan, you know, the camel with the tent bags on it and a tent blanket. And there's some other kind of decoration there. And those are just sort of typical things that would be what we would list as uh, nomadic or uh, tribal. So again, rugs for the floor versus rugs for utilitarian purpose. So you had tent bags, storage bags, and all sorts of storage bags. One was called a Joval, which is a big storage bag. They stored clothes and blankets and all sorts of stuff in it. A mafresh or a bedding or blanket bag uh, that, uh, well, I'll sh show you another one. The original picture of the comparison, that was a, a mafresh uh, in that photograph. A torba, which is a short or and wide storage bag. A hala, which is a short and real wide storage bag. Um, and then you had saddle bags, saddle covers, tent bands, tent decorations, tent blankets, salt bags, grain bags, kapanuk, which is a door trimming, and asmalik, which is a, a wedding decoration and a wall decoration as well. So. Uh, here's just a diagram again, trying to give you an idea that uh, um, uh, the, that's a mafresh right over there. And here's some kind of blanket. And here's a tent blanket, also known as a Killeen. And just gives you an idea of the kind of things, the way they would set up their tent and the decorations they use. Of course, for decoration only, they would weave these tent bands. Now, this one's all rolled up, as you can see, but it's probably about 30 feet long. And it was just a decoration that would go all the way around the top of the room so that uh, and just decorate the wall and in, in the inside the tent. And then they could roll it up when they broke their tent down and traveled to another place. Saddlebags are very, very common. 
they are they were used as as you can imagine on donkeys and on camels and they just threw it over this you know both sides hang down the bag is inside each of these and there's a little ribbon well uh uh cord here that you can tie it up so that nothing falls out and uh, saddlebags were very typical now another thing that was real typical uh, in later times and this is what collectors buy a lot of times these would wear out and maybe the kaleem in the middle would wear out so they would cut it in half and sometimes just cut the backing off and so what you had were what we call bag faces so in other words originally both of these had another you know, was both of these are one of a pair, and um, and now they're just bag faces, and um, of course, and what they in New England, for instance, they use a lot of these on uh, end tables and uh, underneath the lamp and things like that, and it's just decorations in the room. I have been in houses where you've seen a lot of bags and collectible pieces like this on the wall because they're just beautiful decorations and very colorful. They add a lot of decorative uh, taste into a room. Um, sometimes if the backing is still on or they can just add a backing, they'll make pillows out of the bag faces. So these are just called bag face pillows. So let's see, what else? Okay, here, so here's a torba, which is was actually woven as a bag. Now, if you can imagine this, this is actually only about 10 inches from here to there. And it's about three feet wide. And this part is actually the backing and it's just been cut loose so that they could display the whole thing. But originally this part was behind this part and it was a bag and they would hang it on the wall and they would store, uh, let's say their tent pegs or different little things like that. They would just store them in the torbas. Uh, another, wait a minute, I had, oh, I, I don't have a photograph of it, but there's also a, um, I referred to it in, in the beginning here, uh, uh, Haller, which is a short and real wide storage bag. I don't have an example of one, but a Haller is like this, only it's maybe six feet long, 10 inches high, six feet long. They would store their rifles in Hallers. Jovals were basically uh, big bags they used for lots and lots of things. They would store their clothing in it. They would store blankets in it. Um, they would store, you know, when they're traveling, even their kitchen supplies, everything would go in these. These are essentially the, the you know, uh, our Western world uh, suitcase is a Joval. And they could stack one on top of the other. Frequently, I'll see Jovals that have strips of pile and then strip of Kaleem and then another strip of pile and then another strip of Kaleem. And the purpose for the pile was always so that when you stack one on top of the other, it wouldn't slip off. The pile kind of worked like a Velcro and kept it from slipping off. Uh, so here's a mafrish, which they just was uh, really for their bedding supplies. They mostly stored bedding supplies, but they could store clothes and things. I have heard that once in a while they actually use them as a cradle as well. But um, and so what? What's interesting now that I've seen collectors do at, from time to time is they will build a little plywood table and turn this upside down at like you see here. And um, it becomes like a little um, a living room table, coffee table or something, put a piece of glass on top of it so you don't stain it with coffee or something, but it becomes a coffee table. So could you imagine this upside down with some backing like this, which is on the bottom of that? And um, in your living room or some place where you have a lot of rugs and you collect, you know, funky things and stuff. Uh, Osmoliks were actually mostly, almost, almost always woven as a wedding present. And it was just a parent's wedding present to, to the bride. And um, they were always in this sort of shape like this with a triangle at the top. And after it was, you know, it was draped over the camel and the wedding ceremony. And then they would um, you know, later just use it as a wall decoration in their house or in their tent, I mean, but uh, that's what an osmolic is. Another thing, they did a lot of these things, uh, we, we would just call it a door trimming, it's technically, it's called a kaputnik, and, um, and they're just sort of like door trimmings with real pretty tassels and, and uh, fringe on it, and 
and it would just hang over the entrance to their, the inside, the, I, you would actually call it the exit of their tent. So it was inside, inside the tent. Uh, there's just another beautiful Kaputnik. Um, they're just real unusual things. Then they would do wall decorations. This one probably is not the best example because this is a very, very rare piece with all of this netting like this that it's usually you wouldn't see that. Usually it would just be a big bag or build, big design on it, but this is just something very unusual they did. But again, these were just wall decorations that they would use inside the tent. And as I've said, they have become over the years uh, just incredible collector's pieces. There's a magazine, an international magazine on Oriental Rugs called Halley, H-A-L-I. And Halley is always featuring uh, beautiful bag faces and, and wall decorations and things like that. It's just very typical. So another thing, now this is interesting. Most of the stuff I've showed you so far is from uh, very Eastern Persia over by Afghanistan, Turkmen, Baluchistan, and that area, and the, all the tribal places that, li that live over there. However, there are tribal people in the, in the West Persia as well. And this is from the city of Sina, which is in Northwest Persia. Persia. And uh, of course, as you can see, it's a saddle cover. This is where the saddle goes up. This is where the stirrup comes through. First one of these I ever bought, I had no idea what it was. I saw this thing and I thought, my gosh, someone's just cut the whole thing apart. And then I realized that this was a saddle blanket. And this is a real typical uh, Cinna saddle blanket with these kind of colors. The uh, ones from um, Baluch or Afghanistan or Turkmen would be more of those tribal colors that you've seen in some of those last slides. Uh, also, there were salt bags or what we'd call grain bags. A grain bag is much bigger. Salt bags were small, but as you can see, we just, it, it's just a big bag and you fill it up with salt and you know, you keep that. And I, I don't know exactly how they use the salt to feed the animals, but this is where you kept the salt. This is where you kept the grain. And uh, again, these are big collector's pieces. I rarely see salt bags anymore, except for if some big collector is you know, passed away and his, his collection goes up on the market. That's about the only time you see them on the, on the open market. Um, tribal blankets are another thing that was very common. We call them, uh, usually we just market them as Kaleems, K-E-L-I-M. As I sh uh, shared in the, in the, when we were, I think in class three about the loom, that most rugs have pile, but occasionally there's rugs that have no pile, it's flat woven, and that's what a kaleem is. So that's another very typical thing. Here's just a picture of a, <clears throat> a bunch of the pieces I own. Um, and if you notice, I noticed this piece and this piece, that's a pair. So that one time was a saddle bag. Now the, the, just the bag faces are there. You can see a pair here that was a saddle bag, and now it's just bag faces. But there's a beautiful saddlebag right there with the, with the, um, these um, loops are what you would uh, loop the rug, the, the bag together with so nothing would fall out while they were traveling. If we were in person, I would show you how those loops work, but unfortunately I, I cannot do it on a video like this. So anyway, uh, so now let's I hope you learned some about those uh, bag faces and collectibles and the tribal stuff. Now let's talk about one final thing that we'll look at and then this class will be over and that is just uh, other rugs from the turn of the century, 20th century. So there, uh, of course there were the Persian rugs and some Turkish rugs and Indian rugs, but what, there was pat rugs, well, old rugs from India and Pakistan and Kashmir, Tibet, the Caucasus, Turkmenistan, uh, Bessarabian pieces, uh, which is Bessarabia's part of Romania, and, and Chinese rugs. So there were other places, and I'm just going to show you some uh, uh, slides of a few rugs from other places. You know, what I forgot to put here is France, because the first rugs I'm going to show you, well, we'll, we'll skip this. Uh, it's not the first rugs I'm going to show you. Sorry. Well, so anyway, then we'll just look at the map here. So you have there are rugs from France way over here, and there are rugs from uh, in Romania, a place called uh, Bessarabia, and then of course Turkey. And 
course, Persia, but then you've got Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and you know, all of these, the, this map changes, you know, every 20 years, it's, uh, the borders are different, but, uh, but well, let's just talk about some of the rugs from some of these areas. So from India, of course, it has the same history as Persia, essentially. Um, they, they experienced the Renaissance period of the late, uh, in the 17th century, that's when the Taj Mahal was built. And they experienced the same Renaissance period in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, they were influenced by British businessmen and British rug dealers. Uh, they most times used a Persian motif, tightly woven in lighter colors. Now, keep this in mind in contrast to the 1960s and 70s when they were you know, the Pandy Cameron Company, they were producing those indo obasan design, indo Savonnerie design, Indo-French design, Indo-Chinese design. This is way before that. This is when they were doing things that looked a lot like Persian rugs, um, but you could tell they were from India. So one of the, the most typical uh, rugs from there, and pretty much it's kind of like the uh, when we see an old rug and we think it's from India, we usually just call it an Agra, unless we're sure it's something else. I'm only going to show you two examples. This is an Agra, and they oftentimes, they love this red, this deep, deep red color. And they also had a wonderful um, sort of a green taupe color that they used a lot of, a tan sort of shade. And they, they're very beautiful rugs. They're very finely woven, but they have a sort of distinct weave. So you can always tell them, you can tell that it's not a Persian rug, that it's someplace else. By the way, um, Agra was famous for its prisons. It had some very large prisons there. And a lot of um, even Persians got sent to prison in Agra. And so in, in the prisons in Agra, they actually had looms everywhere. So the prisoners would weave um, rugs. So a lot of Agra rugs come from in the prisons in Agra. Now, another type of rug from that area is called the Amritsar. And um, they also had a Persian look. They also used a little bit of red, but they, they were a little finer woven than the Agras, but also had that same sort of feel. As I said, I'd probably still just market this as an Agra because nobody's heard of a Red Star. Eh, of course, nobody's heard of Agra either. But, but, um, and you don't see many of these on the market nowadays. A few every now and then, but you don't see a lot of them. Uh, China, they wove initially for their internal consumption. So in the 17, 1800s, most of it was done for the Chinese people. Um, but at first, sheltered from European and Western influences. However, um, so they were uniquely, truly, ethnically Chinese. But by the beginning of the 20th century, the design began to be influenced by Europe. So by, you know, 1900, uh, other people came in and begun to weave rugs from uh, China. Uh, and by the way, I include Khotan and Samarkand in this, but if you were to go back to that map that we looked at. Uh, Khotan is, is uh, very close to this area here, as well as uh, Samarkand. They're all in this Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, in that area. Um, and, uh, and it's so it would be far uh, Western China. So uh, typical of Chinese rugs was the Peking rug. And um, the, these I guess this is not the most typical pattern. A, a more uh, typical pattern would be the blue with little design all over it. But it, it always used, they loved navy blue, the sky blue, and this tan color. And they're very thin woven rugs. So they're not thick like the super 90s that we sold in the 80s. These are very thin and very pliable. They have a lush, lush wool, which made them last long, even though they were thin. Um, so here again, this is a mainland, but the Peking sort of look. Um, so again, you see the tans and the blues and it was a very thin rug. Now, um, the thicker rugs, um, were we would just market them as mainland Chinese. But this one, Nichols, was a man who actually um, 
created a company over in China in the early 1900s, probably about 1920. And um, so he's, he had a factory that was weaving classic Chinese design rugs in this real thick pile. But he came up with the idea because by the 20s, the, the deco look was in. So he came up with the idea to produce these art deco looks. And a lot of these were made in the 20s and 30s, and we call them Nichols rugs. And um, there's another classic Nichols rug. You, I'm sure you've probably seen one of these once in your life. But um, they were real thick, and they lasted a long time. But they used a lot of different colors. You know, as you can see in both of these, uh, oranges and greens and pinks. But, and this one with a light purple border, I guess you'd call it, and just all the different flowers and stuff. But it was classic Art Deco look, and it was very in all the way up through the 50s and 60s. And actually, even in the 80s, when I do shows in New York, people were always looking for a great Art Deco piece. But they sort of fell out of um, favor by now. They, I don't sell many at all. Most of the ones I do sell, we ship to... Um, other places. Italy likes this kind of look nowadays. Uh, Fetty was another man that started another company, uh, and it was sort of a cross between the Peking and the mainland Chinese weave. Uh, not quite full Peking, not quite full mainland Chinese, like with a thick pile. So sort of in between the two of them. But he did all these scenes. So Fetty did a lot of scenic pieces. Uh, oftentimes you'd see boats or fish or and, and birds and things like that. And he just did real well at producing that kind of stuff. So in Khotan, this, this one on the left here is a very, very early one. This one's probably about 1910 uh, or so, but it, very typical was these three circular uh, medallions, one, one after the other, which is very typical of the kind of weave they did. You see the little Chinese Greek key design and, uh, Excuse me. I'm sorry. Um, but this is typical of what Kotan did. Now, very close to Kotan was another area called Samarkand. And of course, we showed you on the map that uh, Samarkand and Kotan were closer to Persia than they were to mainland Chinese. So they, they picked up a lot of Persian influence, as you can see. I used to own in our house, we had a uh, rug that looked very similar to this, only it was red background. And that was, it was classic Samarkand. Looked like a Persian rug, but it had a whole different feel to it. So you just knew it wasn't Persian. But if you didn't know, you wouldn't know that it was Samarkand. Uh, Turkey in the Caucasus, again, similar history to Persia. Uh, Turkey produced Kulas, Ushak, Sabas, Herakis. I showed you Herakis and several of the other classes. There are, those are the silk pieces, sometimes with uh, four, five, six. I've seen them with a thousand knots per square inch. Kaleem, Milas, Bergamo. These are all rugs from Turkey. This is classic Milas. Milas again had this, uh, this green top shade. They did really well. They used it a lot of times in the rugs as, as well as this uh, rust color that they used a lot in the rugs. So here's uh, uh, a rug that became very popular in the 80s and 90s, but they were woven in 1910, you know, 1920, the Turkish Ushak rugs, which were known for their real pale, pale colors. Now, Ushak also produced another rug which was driven by the European market. So these didn't come to America in 1910. Most of these went to the European market. And oftentimes you'd see these pieces in those big castles. If you've ever traveled through uh, Europe and, and Ireland and those big castles, they used rugs and it, this typical color is this uh, sort of steel blue, gray blue uh, color and this rust color. Uh, here's a, this is more of a typical design, but I think this one's maybe been washed and it, it's brought the, toned down the uh, rust color. So it, if you can imagine this motif, I mean, excuse me, uh, yeah, this motif and these colors, that is what was very typical of the, those early Ushaks. The, the lighter shade ones like this all came to the U.S. They weren't woven for the European market. They were woven for the U.S. market. Remember, 
that in the early 1900s, a lot of the uh, drive what was from what the American market was demanding. And that's why they changed the looks of their rugs to fit the American market. Uh, Bergamo was more of a tribal, by the way, if we were to, uh, I don't wanna go back this many slides, but if you were to look at Turkey, of course, Istanbul is right over here uh, in the far uh, west, but most of the weaving was done in central Turkey not in over by Istanbul, but farther inland in, in central Turkey. In fact, Bergamo is very close to the Caucasus border. And uh, oftentimes people would mistake this for a Kazakh from the Caucasus, but it's actually from Bergamo. Classic colors of a Bergamo. There's an old Kula rug, which has the same sort of look again uh, they used a lot of tan, and this sort of typical running border like this was very typical of Kula. Kaleem were flat woven pieces, as we discussed, and they did a lot of those in Turkey, although a lot of them were also done in uh, the Caucasus. If you remember the, um, the Mafrish uh, cradle uh, blanket bag that I showed you, that was a, a, a Caucasian blanket bag. Uh, this is a Turkish um, Kaleem. The, the other one was from the Caucasus. So from the Caucasus, yeah, a classic, typical rug is the Turkish Kazakh, I mean, excuse me, the Caucasian Kazakh. Now, let me just tell you a quick story about the, these Caucasian rugs. Ca Caucasus is an area about the size of New Jersey. Now, of course, there's several different companies, uh, countries there since Russia uh, uh, sort of took off its claim. Uh, Armenia has become a country again, and there's several other little countries there as well that they hosted the uh, Winter Olympics in, in uh, uh, 2016 uh, or 2018, whenever it was. The Winter Olympics were in, in the Caucasus. I forgot the name of that country. But, but um, when I st first started dealing with old rugs and I had this mentor that was helping me with things, I, you know, he, he told me that Caucasian rugs were broken down into three types of rugs. There was the Kazakh, which was the loosely woven one, the Shirvans, which were the very tightly woven ones, and the Kabistans, which was anything between the Shirvans and the Kazakhs. Well, it's kind of funny because Kabistan is apparently a made up name. There is no city or town called Kabistan. Um, and it's actually sort of like the same way we made up Serapi for an old Harise. Well, it was just a made up name for, for rugs that didn't fit into the classification of a Kazakh or a Shirvan. But for the most part, Kazakhs are loosely woven and for the most part, Shirvans are tightly woven. But golly, there is, there's about 15 major rug weaving areas in the Caucasus. And of those 15, almost every one of them has anywhere between 20 to 40 different types of rugs. So you, there are so many rugs from the Caucasian area. Books, the Turkish rugs, I have a book literally two inches thick on Turkish rugs. I have a book about one inch thick on Caucasian, well, I have two or three books on Caucasian rugs. Um, and, you know, and it just still doesn't cover it all because there's so many rugs from the Caucasian, but we look at, at Kabistan, Dagestan is near the Shirvan district, so it's a much finer and tightly woven Frequently, you see this prayer design in Dagestan's, um, you know, with the uh, niches and so on and so forth, but very finely woven. There's a beautiful shirvan, which again, very tightly woven. Shirvan oftentimes use these uh, diamond shaped medallions and you see three or four of them or even five or six. I think I own a 10 foot long piece that looks very similar to this. So it has maybe eight of these medallions down, right down the middle of it, but that's Classic Shirvan. Uh, near Shirvan is another area. And, you know, it's almost like you could think of them as counties. Uh, and in the Kuba County, actually, the Kuba district is what they actually refer to them as. Um, they produce some rugs. They were experts in this color along this uh, uh, inner band here. This beautiful sort of a pinkish salmon color. They were experts in that. They used that in a lot of the rugs, so it's a real uh, 
telltale way of telling a, a Kuba rug. Kuba also did a, a fabulous job with these borders, which we actually call a crab border, but it's not at all. It was a big flower with a, a couple um, designs or, or tendrils coming out of it. Um, Zekor is another rug from that Kuba Shirvan area very tightly woven. Oftentimes they use these bursting medallions like this and uh, you'd see uh, oh, different types of birds in the, in, the, in the motif and so on and so forth. Um, Sumac uh, again was another area where they mostly produce flat woven rugs. Actually Sumac itself is not an area but it's a style of weave that was done mostly by Kuba and Shirvan, I suppose, but mostly by Kuba. And it, 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 if you remember in the third class when we talked about the loom, we talked about rugs that have pile, rugs that are flat, which are known as kaleem, which are reversible, so it's flat on both sides. And then we talked about a style of rug called a sumac, which is flat on one side, but it has hanging threads all over it on the back side. So that's what this is. And it's a Caucasian sumac. If you've ever been to, uh, in North Carolina, the Biltmore, um, that beautiful mansion up in North Carolina, in his great room, I think it's called the Hunt Room, where he has all the uh, uh, animal heads up on the walls and stuff, he has three real big sumacs, one, two, three, and the, right down the middle of the room. And they all look like, you know, very similar to one another, but they're all different. And they're these flat woven rugs. Um, probably, this is a really interesting rug. It is one of my most popular and asked about uh, Caucasian rugs, known as an Ivo Kazakh. However, what's interesting about it is it's neither an eagle or a Kazakh. It's actually from the Karabakh district, from a city called Shalabur. Actually, it's a small little village called Kar in the Karabakh district. And um, I think they must, because of these shoots like this that look like uh, maybe eagle's wings. They Somewhere along the line, it got nicknamed uh, Eagle Kazakh. Other people actually call it a sunburst Kazakh, but it's just really just a motif, you know, a real uh, uh, classic motif that they used in these rugs. So it's not an eagle, not a Kazakh. It's actually technically a shallow bird from Cal Karabakh. But if I told you I have a shallow bird, you had no idea what I was talking about. But if I said I had an eagle gazaki, you, you could probably picture this. Because as I said, this is one of my best selling Caucasian rugs. Uh, here's another rug that got misnamed a Kazakh, which is also from Karabakh, but it has this loose, coarse weave like Kazakhs do. And so they call them, uh, you know, Kazakhs. But this one it, um, is. This border that I showed you before, we called a crab border, but there's the rosettes with the little vines coming out of it. And uh, what's real unusual about this, well, one is the big wide ivory border, but also is this wonderful green color that you see in this rug. Just a fabulous color. Karabakh and Kazakh both perfected their greens. They perfected their yellows as well. And that's what makes green green is yellow and blue. So they perfected their yellow, so they consequently also perfected their green. Okay, for just a few more minutes, we'll look at rugs and textiles from other countries beside, uh, you know, the typical countries. Okay, so from France, uh, I told you there were some rugs from France. I forgot to put it on that list. But the, these, uh, these are, this is probably a copy. This is probably a, a truly 17th century French savannery. French savonneries were at least um, that thick. I mean, they were at least an inch and a half to two inches thick. They used this wonderful, lush, lush wool. And it was a real thick ply, so there weren't a lot of knots per square inch. But it had all of its lanolin in it, in it still, and they were just fabulous rugs. Now, granted, you know, uh, a savonnery design obviously makes a statement and you have to have a French look for it, but they were so lush and so wonderful and they were very popular rugs in the 17th century and 18th century. And they were actually making them in the 19th century. Um, however, by the 19th century, 
Um, a lot of people were saying, I can't afford a Savonnerie. They, because there was so much wool in it, they were so expensive uh, to make. And so consequently, very expensive to buy. And uh, so people, so the demand drove the rug dealers in France to come up with a new idea. And it's the same, these rugs known as an Aubusson are essentially a French Killeen. So it's the Killeen weave, um, uh, you know, with a Savonnerie design and their French Aubusson. You know, in 1980, uh, this same thing happened with Indian rugs. People were saying, we need something a little cheaper to be able to sell to uh, people that don't have as much money, but want the look. And so they came up with the idea, maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't, but of durries. So in the 80s, that was a really hot thing, these Indo durries. Um, but I just got tired of selling because people, you know, uh, they, they weren't that much money and they were driving me crazy. People still wanted to take seven home on approval and try them out for a week and see which one they wanted. And when it was all said and done, I made a $200 sale and I just said, this is not worth it. But they've sort of fell out of popularity now anyway. They don't even make them anymore. So, but Obasans were just like the Duries of today. They were the French Savonneries uh, in a flat weave and that, that way they could make more of them and sell them a lot less money. Of course, uh, they did wall decorations in France too. And uh, so these are known as portiers. This obviously is a window uh, covering or a doorway covering. Um, but you know how uh, in France they have these real tall ceilings. And so there's windows that go from floor, floor to ceiling. And in between them, they would hang a portier like this one. Very classic piece. This one is a very finely woven. In fact, it has gold embroidered threads along the edge and in the flowers and in these little motifs here as well. But the beautiful flower basket, the ribbon. And this is classic of a French Aubusson portier. I think I have, yeah, this is a, a room, you know, a classic French room with a big tapestry. And there's the big Savonnerie on the floor. Um, Spain actually copied the Savonneries. So they, by the 1900s, by 1880, I guess, they started producing copies of Savonneries. They were thick, just like the Savonnerie. They didn't use quite as good a wool, so it felt a little drier than the early French Savonneries. But they had a wonderful look, and they were very popular rugs, and they were woven in Spain. Um, then Spain, what they became more... Um, uh, known for were these uh, typical Spanish rugs uh, with the palmette motif like that. Now this particular piece is real unusual because I have not ever had one this early. This is actually not from around 1900. Most of these are from the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and so the color is a little brighter. This one is real muted and soft, but that's from Spain. So of course, uh, a French the French also produced tapestries as well as their bordering uh, com country of uh, Brussels or where the Flemish tapestries would come from. So these are Flemish. Generally speaking, Flemish are a little tighter motif. And so they get a little uh, busier motif. Uh, French pieces are usually a little more open and spread. And um, uh, oftentimes they do the castle and the, and the background and in the foreground you have a uh you know a pond or you know birds like these and so on and so forth um i actually uh years ago i i had a collection of of uh, flemish and french tapestries that we displayed in our shop for a week it was a huge collection this piece is 12 feet high and 20 some feet wide fabulous piece um, from the Flemish, from, from the uh, Brussels area. Here's a French one. So the French ones, again, not as tightly woven, but uh, French oftentimes did these lover scenes like this sort of thing. And uh, remember when we were talking about dyes in class uh, four, and we talked, I told you, if you've ever seen the old French or Brussels tapestries, and the trees are all blue, 
And you ever asked yourself why? Well, you know, these were originally green, but as the yellow faded out, the green turned more blue. And that's what happened in this case. So, but this is a beautiful old fringe tapestry. Um, uh, did I skip a slide? I guess I didn't. Okay, um, so here's uh, in Persia and in India, they did these paisleys. I have a real pretty um, paisley up there on the wall that I just used to decorate right here. There's a little paisley I used to decorate, but they they were, um, a lot of them were hand woven. And then they started, they came up with a technique to do a machine weave of them as well. So, so these are all paisleys. This is a paisley shawl. It's made to fold in half so that this border shows and then another border shows right here and you wear it as a shawl. And that's a beautiful piece. England produced their wonderful needle points. This one is from 1920. And again, it has that classic Victorian look that uh, was so popular in 10s and 20s and 30s. But this is classic needlepoint, you know, with maybe 100 knots per square inch. Now, they also did some very fine needlepoint. Before I explain the actual tapestry itself, this has got petty point in it with like 400 knots per square inch, as well as the typical needlepoint. But this needlepoint probably has about 200 knots per square inch. This tapestry is a copy of a painting called The Surprise Lovers by uh, Renee Marguerite. Um, and she was, uh, uh, or he was a very popular painter. This painting was one of the most copied paintings uh, in the early 1900s. Everybody made their rendition of the surprise lovers. And here it is in tapestry form, the surprise lovers. So um, Russia up in the Kazakhstan area, they also did their weaving. These are what's known as Suzannis which actually simply means embroidery in Russian. But Suzanne's always use this motif with these big roses and flowers in the border and, and uh, flowers in the field, but they were known for these big circles that look like circles, but they were just flowers like that. And I don't know if you remember, but in a couple of classes ago when we were looking at new rugs and I showed you some of the great rugs from Afghanistan, they have copied the Suzanne design and put it into rugs. So there is a Suzanne uh, design, you know, oriental rug, and, but this is what they copy, pieces just like this. So and then of course you have little bags uh, from Turkey and, and Kazakhstan and Baluchistan and, and uh, Afghanistan and all over. So I think that's it, yes, so that's it. So. Um, I am so glad that, that I've been able to share with you. I hope that you have uh, enjoyed these um, teachings, these little mini teachings. Uh, we do we do a lot of classes. We teach a, a 12 hour, well, it's now six hour class for the continuing education program of William and Mary, it's called OSHER. And we do that a couple times a year. And um, we speak at, you know, women's clubs and men's clubs, doctors, wives clubs and stuff. and we do things like this because I feel like it's very important to educate the public in, in rugs. It, once you get into rugs, um, it, it's just such a, it's such a great thing to collect and see and understand and know about. And uh, I have really, really enjoyed uh, talking with you. I hope you've had a chance to watch all eight of these. And don't forget, if you have any questions, just send us a letter at info at shia.com and we'll be glad to try to answer any questions or stop by the shop and we'll give you one of those little free um, you know booklets that I showed you a couple of classes ago and uh, again I just want to say it's just been really delightful being with you and I hope you have enjoyed this series of talks on oriental on my world of oriental rugs thank you <laughs>